All right, let's get started. Um, welcome to the third lecture of 188. Um, today's topic is informed search. A couple of announcements first. Homework one, search, has been released. It's due on Tuesday, but keep in mind that typically homework will be due on Mondays. So don't fall into the pattern of thinking it's going to be due on Tuesdays. It's pretty much always going to be Mondays, but because of Labor Day, it's on Tuesday next week. There's two components, electronic and written. Uh, you should do both. Um, it's not a choice, one or the other, both are for you to do. Electronic is on great scope. You solve things and you can try as many times as you like till you get it right and until the deadline hits. The written component is an exam style uh, two-pager. Uh, we highly recommend you print it out, try to work it on your own. And then after you've done that for, let's say, uh, half an hour, an hour on your own, feel free to discuss with other students and so forth to try to get a better understanding. But then still, you have to submit your own work, not uh, some other students' work, of course. These will be graded on effort, and effort slash completion, which means that we will check if you it looks like you tried as hard as you would try on an exam to solve these problems. That's what it means. And the next week, you'll get to make corrections to anything you got wrong by grading it yourself. Um, and again, that grading yourself will be graded on whether you did it precisely, not on whatever grades you would have given yourself. Project One Search has been released. Um, it's due next week, Friday at 4 p.m. Um, you might wonder why 4 p.m. seems pretty arbitrary. Um, we pick 4 p.m. because um, a good fraction of students like to work last minute. And if we pick 4 p.m., then, I mean, we don't recommend working last minute, but if we pick 4 p.m., the students who do work till the last minute still have a Friday evening free for doing something else and weekend. So that's our rationale here, to try to help you have Friday evening free. <laughs> one important thing is that project one is representative of the projects we'll have throughout the remainder of the course. Project zero is not. So if you thought project zero was easy, you got it done very quickly, and you, project one is different and it's representative of everything that follows. If you're worried about your coding skills, your coding background, Project One will tell you how ready you are. The entire teaching staff is there to help you. If you have questions, post on Piazza, come to office hours. We want you to solve these problems. Um, you can work in a team of two. We recommend that you pair code or in some other way work together. We don't recommend you just split the work because you'll only learn half of the material that way. Um, when you submit into Gradescope, one person submits and has to mark the other student, their partner, if you work with a partner, to make sure that they get a grade too. So don't forget to mark your partner if you had one, or they will not get that grade. Section started this week. Um, as I mentioned before, you can go to any, but you have priority in the one you signed up for on Piazza. Um, any questions about logistics? Yes? There's only... So there's only one type of discussion per week. There is many, many that are meant to be the same, but there are different times and different GSIs, so there will always be a little bit of variation on exactly how each GSI will do things. And also, on Fridays, we will try to record a webcast of the material covered in the section that week. So you also have a webcast coverage of whatever was that week's section. Any other questions about logistics? Over there. So for homework, we want you to submit something that matches the template that we have. If you want to relate it, that's, that's fine, but we want it to match up with the template that we have because that's important for our grading. Um, we recommend you print it out and write on it because that's most similar to exams, but ultimately if you prefer to type it up, that's fine too, but follow the template structure that is in our PDF. Other questions about logistics? Okay. Today's topic is informed search. Um, what that means, we're going to cover something called heuristics, 
greedy search, a star search, and then we'll see something called graph search, which will be an improvement to the tree search we've already seen um, towards the end of lecture. OK, let's first recap what is search. Um, well, in search, uh, what we're typically interested in is somehow capturing something about the real world inside a computer. So, and the way we'll do that is by defining a search problem. The search problem is defined by a set of states, which corresponds to the configurations of the world. Not necessarily all details of the configurations of the world, but the abstraction of the world that is relevant for the agent's decision making. There are actions that can be taken, and there are typically costs associated with those actions. There is a successor function, which defines for each state and each action that's available in that state where you would end up, and also the cost associated with it. So that's modeling how the world works, again, at some level of abstraction that you choose as right for your problem. And then there's a start state, that's where the agent starts, and there is a goal test, which, which allows you to check if a current state that you feed into that test satisfies the goal condition or not. If it does, it's a goal state, and you can uh, declare success if you get there. That's the problem structure. The computation we tend to do is building up a search tree. Not fully, but partially, hopefully. Um, the nodes in a search tree correspond to paths to states. Okay, we'll see some examples again soon. And these paths or plans have costs associated with them, which is the sum of all the costs of all the actions you took along that path. A search algorithm is an algorithm that systematically builds out the search tree, hopefully only a fraction of the entire search tree, but maybe worst case, the entire search tree. And it has to choose an ordering of what to currently expand. This is what is ready to be expanded is called the fringe, but you have to choose which one to expand first. Then an optimal search algorithm is one that finds least cost plans. OK, so not all search is about pathing, so we'll use a slightly different example here, pancake flipping. OK, what is the setup here? This is a setup where there is four pancakes. They have different sizes. And the goal is to get the pancakes stacked with the biggest one at the bottom, second biggest one on top of that, and so forth, smallest one at the top. Your action space is you can put your spatula between two pancakes or underneath the bottom one, and then decide to flip everything that's above your spatula. For example, if the spatula goes right there where it's shown, it would flip the top two, and the bottom two would stay in place. So for a stack of four pancakes here, you effectively have uh, three actions available to you. You can go between number two and number three, between number three and number four, or below number four. Going between one and two doesn't do anything for you because you're just keeping the top one on top. OK, so that's the successor states from this particular state. Um, you might wonder, um, who might care about pancakes? Um, well, um, so the cost will be the number of pancake flipping. Well, pancake flipping robots is one type of species that cares a lot about this, but there are actually other people who cared about this. And people you, unless you looked at the slides ahead of time, definitely wouldn't guess. Um, Bill Gates and Christos Papadimitriou wrote a paper this past Tuesday, Tuesday, exactly 40 years ago, about pancake flipping as an abstraction for sorting things. OK, so now back to the problem. Here is the state space graph. Well, part of the state space graph, there is more states. How many states are there, you think, in this state space total, if we drew the entire graph? Any thoughts? Anyone? Over there. Would you say 24? 24, OK, how do you get to that? Exactly. So let me say that again, just because of the acoustics, maybe hard for people behind you to hear you. Um, the answer was 24 total. So you can see we're not showing them all on this slide. And how do we get to that? Well, you first have four choices as to what goes at the bottom. Then you have three choices left for what goes on top of that, two choices left what goes on top of that, and then one choice left for what goes on the top, and that multiplication is 24. 
Okay, so this is part of the state space graph. The costs here correspond to how many pancakes you're flipping. You can imagine that maybe the robot has some energy cost. Depending on how many pancakes it has to lift, it expends energy, and it prefers to lift as, as few as possible and get to a goal. And the goal is to get into this configuration here where they're nicely lined up. Okay, so not all search is padding. It could be pancake flipping, and there will be other examples in the future. How does tree search work? And we'll illustrate it with the pancake flipping problem. Tree search goes through a loop. It initializes, before going into the loop, with putting on the fringe the start state, the current situation in the world. Then it checks. Are there any candidates for expansion? That is, is there anything on the fringe? And the answer is yes, this is our fringe. Then it decides to expand that. Well, it'll first, it'll first check if it's the goal. It's not the goal. Then it'll decide to expand it. This will be our new fringe. And then it'll go back around. It'll check, is there anything left on the fringe? The answer is yes. Then pick something with some strategy, one of those three. Then it'll check, does it achieve the goal condition? The answer will be no. It'll then um, expand, and this process repeats. And then at some point, we might expand this one over here and declare success. This algorithm is underneath all the search algorithms we've seen so far. Depth first, breadth first, um, uniform cost. Today we'll see greedy and A star. They will still use this. The only difference is the choice of strategy used to expand things from the fringe. And at the end of lecture, we'll see a modification to this called graph search, where we'll make, put in one extra check here, um, but otherwise will be the same. And we'll also apply to all the other, st all the strategies that we've seen. Okay, so in this case, the total cost would be seven to achieve the goal state if this is how you got there. The way you can implement this, um, no matter what the strategy is, you can implement this with a priority queue. Your fringe is stored as a priority queue. Um, when you pick something from the priority queue, your strategy determines what the priorities are, and you pick based on whoever has highest priority. Now, if you specifically are interested in depth first search, you could also use a stack instead of a priority queue. If you're specifically interested in breadth first search, first search, you could also use a regular queue instead of a priority queue, which will make it slightly more efficient, but will make your implementation less unified. For project purposes, either, either way is fine. Uh, you can choose uh, whether you want to do it in a unified way or have slightly special purpose versions for depth first and breadth first. So last lecture, what we covered was uninformed search. And what that meant, let's say it was uniform cost search, that the strategy corresponded to expand the lowest path cost from what's currently on the fringe. The good news, it's complete and optimal, which means if a solution exists, it will find it. And it'll, it'll actually find the optimal solution, meaning the way to achieve the goal at lowest cost. The bad news, it searches in every direction um, equally hard. For example, in this 2D space over here, it would expand in all directions at equal pace, even though the goal is on this side. It doesn't have any information about the goal. All it does with the goal is every now and then check, do I satisfy the goal condition? But nothing else about the goal is used, so it doesn't know that it's going in the right or wrong direction. So pictorially, what this corresponds to is, let's say we um, run uniform cost search on a empty grid, then it would look and so the way we visualize this, whenever a state gets expanded for the first time, we show it highlighted here, uniform cost search, which is equally radiate out in all directions, and then finally finds the goal. And if we have a, um, if we have a maze, ooh, that runs so fast that we didn't see it in action. Um, okay, so what happened here is uniform cost search was run, and it highlighted in red nodes that are expanded during the uniform cost search. You are bright red if you're expanded early on. You're darker red if you're expanded later on. So the last one expanded would be around here, where... Does that cursor show up over there? Let's see. Yeah. So it would be around here. That's the goal state. That's the last one expanded. 
and declare success. But what you see here in this maze is that it actually expanded every single reachable state except for just one of them over here. Why did it do that? Well, uniform cost search doesn't know where the goal is going to be, so it's to uniformly explore in all directions. And if you want to know, will it have expanded the state or not, and you want to quickly guess that for a maze like this, you would say, okay, let me eyeball what's the shortest path to the goal. I find the shortest path to the goal from Pac-Man to the goal. I measure the length, and I know that uniform cost search will expand every state that is at that at less than that distance from the start, which in this case means every state except for this loner over here, which is actually further away from the start than the goal. But everything else gets expanded. So we're hoping to make that more efficient today. So the way we're going to make it more efficient is by infusing information about where the goal is while the search algorithm is running. These are called heuristics. Uh, a heuristic is a function that estimates how close a state is to a goal. And it will be designed for a particular search problem. Everything we've seen so far, you build a search problem abstraction, and you can run your algorithm. If you want a heuristic, we have to take one additional step. We have to come up with a heuristic function for the current problem we're trying to solve. So we'll build a heuristic function. Um, there are some different choices that you can make for these heuristic functions. So we'll dive into that a little bit today. So for example, for Pac-Man, needing to find the one pallet here in this maze, what could be a reasonable heuristic function? A reasonable way, is way of measuring how close am I to the goal? Any thoughts over there? So the suggestion was Manhattan distance. Why would that make sense? Well, you can only move northeast, southwest. So your motion is always along that grid pattern. And so Manhattan distance is... Well, in this case, Manhattan distance, of course, measures the distance that to achieve that path to the goal, you'd have to go through walls, but it gives you an estimate. And that's what heuristics are about. It's a way of quickly getting an estimate of how far away the goal might be. And Manhattan distance is quick to compute, and it's very much tied into how you move in this space, except that it ignores the walls. You could also use Euclidean distance. Um, so this Manhattan distance. Euclidean distance would look like this. It's probably not as good a fit for this problem because Pac-Man cannot move diagonally, and so it doesn't measure as well how far away you are from the goal. How about for this pathing problem we saw last time, finding a path in Romania from Arad to Bucharest? Well, um, again, heuristic is something you want to be able to compute easily, and that gives us a guess of how close we are to the goal. So straight line distance could be something, because all we need for that is the GPS coordinates of each city. From that, we can compute the straight line distance to other cities, and that's a good measure of how far we are away. If you want to go to Bucharest, then it would be all straight line distances to Bucharest. And this would be our heuristic function, and this is, in a tabular format, what it could look like. Like your heuristic function, if there's only a finite set of states, assigns a number to each state, which is how far you think that state is, or how much cost you think you'll still incur from that state to get to the goal. How about for pancake flipping? Any thoughts on heuristics for that? Here. So the suggestion was the number of pancakes not in the correct position. And the reason that could be a good heuristic is because every pancake not in the correct position has to be flipped at some point, at least once. And when, whenever you do an action, the cost is the number of pancakes flipped. So number of pancakes out of place is definitely an estimate of how much cost you're going to encounter before you can get everything in place. So that's one choice, number of pancakes out of place. Um, any other thoughts on other heuristics? This tends to be an art. For many problems, there is many, many heuristics you can come up with. Uh, chain of correct, like, Longest chain of correctly ordered pancakes. And so, can you say a little more about how that measures how far we are away from achieving the goal? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so the idea, the idea here is that you look at a, essentially subset of the pancakes and see how many are already in the right order because that means they are ready for whatever we need to achieve at the end. Now, one subtlety here is that um, usually we measure heuristics measured in a similar unit as cost. So instead of measuring how many are already ordered nicely, which in case of the goal state would be all four, um, when we're at the goal state, we want the heuristic to be zero. So we want to do maybe something like four minus the uh, function that you proposed to make sure that it measures distance from the goal, not higher when closer to the goal. But it's a good suggestion um, with that small caveat. Any other thoughts? Here's another one. One that we put on the slides is the number that is the ID number of the largest pancake that is still out of place. How does that work? Well, um, which is the largest pancake still out of place here? It's the one at the top there. It's pancake number three. So then this heuristic would say three. Why does that make sense? Well, the, that pancake is still out of place. That means that everything three up still needs to undergo some flipping operation in the stack. Otherwise, there's no way to get this one in place. It measures something about how deep you'll need to go into the stack for some operation before you could ever complete. So this is what we're showing here. Later, we'll also uh, look at what might make one heuristic better than another, another heuristic. And of course, a lot of it has to do with accuracy. And so in this case, um, let's compare the one that's on the slide with the one that was proposed earlier about how many pancakes still out of place. So we'll look at this one here. How many pancakes still out of place? That is two. Okay. So what we see is that these are different numbers, and that's going to happen often with different heuristics. One of them may be more precise than the other one, because actually there is an action here that takes you straight to the goal state, and it has a cost of three. And so this heuristic here is more precise than this one. Um, now, there are other trade-offs in heuristics at times related to not just precision, but also speed of uh, finding your heuristic. But what we see here is that in this case, we might prefer number of the largest pancake that is still out of place over number of pancakes still out of place. So once we have heuristics, we can start doing something called greedy search. In greedy search, what we're going to do is the strategy to pick something from the fringe is to pick the thing that looks like it's already closest to the goal. So it's like you're searching, and you look on your fringe and say, oh, wow, this one's already pretty close, closest of everything on the fringe. Let me pick that one. So what does that look like? On this map of Romania, well, we still start with the start state. Then we expand. At this point, we have three nodes on the fringe. And the numbers shown are these straight line distances to Bucharest, our heuristic function. And Sibiu has the shortest straight line distance to Bucharest. So we started here in Arad. Sibiu is over here. Shortest straight line distance. So Greedy will say expand that one. Then we have now a fringe with six members. We again look at which one of these is closest to the goal. It's Fagras over here with a heuristic of 176. We expand that one. Now we have a fringe of seven. And in that fringe of seven, one of them actually has a heuristic of zero. That's as good as it gets. It's actually the goal. Uh, we would pick this one, expand it, and declare a success. And we would have found this path over here. Okay. What can go wrong here? And we might already have gone wrong. Over there. So the answer was, um, you might choose a path that's a local optimum, not a global optimum, or maybe to rephrase it a little bit in the terminology we're, we're using here, um, you might, and for this specific example, you see Fagras here, and you expand it, and you end up at the goal, and you found the path, but it turns out that this other path is actually better. The lower path is the better path. And you didn't find that. Why did we not find that? 
Well, we didn't find it because from Sibiu, we compared Fagras and Rimniku Vilshea. And with Fagras, we kind of took a very big action. We covered a lot of ground. It was a bit off to the side, but we covered a lot of ground. And we ended up closer to Bucharest after that action. But it was a costly action. But Greedy Search ignores that this was a costly action. It doesn't pay attention to how much cost has already been incurred. It just looks at what's left. And so when you take a costly action like this that brings you closer to the goal, you're likely to go for that node again, and then maybe again, and ignore maybe something that could have been more promising, which is go this route, which was a cheaper action, and found, you could have found a cheaper path to the goal. So what can go wrong is that you kind of go down a rabbit hole that looks good and keep going rather than carefully considering other opportunities that might still exist. So greedy search is a strategy where you expand a node that you think is closest to a goal state. It, the heuristic is the thing that measures the distance to nearest goal for each state. Um, a common case is that this best first approach takes you straight down some path, um, possibly to the wrong goal, but often to a goal still. Worst case is that it behaves like a badly guided depth first search in that the heuristic sends you the wrong way, wrong way, wrong way, and makes you explore everything except for where you need to be. Of course, this depends on your heuristic and so forth, but with a poor heuristic, this can absolutely happen. Now let's take a look at how well this works on our two examples. So think for a moment. What do you think greedy search will do in this scenario? Straight line. OK, I think so too. Now, there's a slight caveat there. It really depends on the heuristic it's using. Right? Um, so if I don't tell you what heuristic it's using, you can't know for sure what it's going to be doing. But here the heuristic is um, measuring straight line distance to the goal. Um, and so what we expect to happen is that then it will keep expanding towards the goal. Let's see if it actually happens. It does and finds a solution very quickly. Very low compute cost and actually the optimal path in this case. Now let's take a look at Pac-Man in the small maze. Let's actually, this is uniform cost. We need greedy. So again, this runs so fast we don't see it highlight. But what happened here is that as we run the search, whenever we expand a state for the first time, call it successor function, we color that corresponding square red. The brighter red you are, the earlier that happened. The darker red you are, the later that happened. And black means it never happened. So greedy did not expand nearly as much as uniform cost search. So it was a faster calculation. But the path it finds is actually suboptimal. Right? It goes off to the left, down, back to the right, comes down, and then off to the left again. It's a suboptimal path, but it was found quickly. You might wonder, why does it not try the move to the right? Why is that never being expanded? It's because the heuristic tells us that from that spot one to the right from where Pac-Man started, the heuristic value, which in this case is Manhattan distance, is higher than for any of the nodes we did expand. And so it's still on the fringe waiting to be up next, but it never gets its turn. We expand the goal before we get to it. It's on that fringe. It's waiting, but just never got called upon. OK, so now we're going to see something that hopefully can bring together um, best of both worlds. Uh, let's think about this a little bit pictorially. Who knows about the fable of the tortoise and the hare? Most of you? Not everybody? Who doesn't know about the fable of the tortoise and the hare? You don't know about it. OK, great. Or do you have a question? Or you don't know about it? OK, it's a great fable. Um, not sure if I can do it justice uh, explaining it here, but the gist is that the tortoise and the hare are in a race. And they have to get to a destination before the other. And the hare runs off and is way ahead of the tortoise early on, but then gets off on a sidetrack, takes a nap, does all kinds of things because it feels like it's winning anyway. And in the meantime, the tortoise just slow and steady, slow and steady, slow and steady, keeps moving, keeps moving, keeps moving. 
and actually gets to the destination first. Okay, it's meant to be the fables about teaching people a lesson, um, but we're going to do some analogies here. Uniform cost search is our tortoise. It's slow and steady. Um, it tries out every single thing that might be cheaper than what we've considered that might be cheap enough, and only will declare success when it's tried everything that's cheaper than the cheapest path to the goal. Greedy is like the hare. It just guns off, tries to find uh, a path to the goal, but it might go down wrong habit ho rabbit hole and might not do so well after all. Now, what? Well, wouldn't it be beautiful if we could have something like this? <laughs> so we're bringing together slow and steady with greedy and fast. So it's one thing to make a cartoon. Now we need to put an algorithm behind this cartoon. It's called A-star search, topic of this lecture, main topic of this lecture. Okay, so let's start comparing Uniform cost, greedy, and then A star on a simple example here. And again, keep in mind, these examples are not meant to be representative of problems you would really want to solve. It's just to illustrate the algorithms. So what does it mean to run uniform cost search? Well, on the left, we have the state space graph. On the right here, we have the search tree. I have shown the entire search tree here. What will uniform cost do? It will go in tiers through that search tree. Initially, S is on the fringe, then A, and S is off. Then A will go off, and we'll have B, D, E on the fringe. And then what will happen next? We now have choices to make. There's three options. We will go by lowest cost so far. To get to B, cost us two. To get to D, cost us four. To get to E, cost us nine. So then uniform cost will go here, to its lowest, expand B, and we'll have found this path to C, and so forth. Now, what we see here, if we look at the graph, start state A, B, C, that's kind of going off in the wrong direction. But uniform cost search doesn't know. It does not have access to any information about the goal except for a Boolean check, am I at the goal or not? So it doesn't know, and so it doesn't do so well. Now, it's slow and steady, and ultimately will explore that search tree till it finds the shortest path to the goal, but it's going to waste a lot of time on things that are not promising. Greedy. How about greedy? Well, greedy orders by forward cost, the heuristic function. So greedy would also start with the start state, expand that, get just A on the fringe, expand that. Now there are options, and it would check H. H is 1 here, 2 here, 6 here. It would say 1 is best, let me expand this one. Now we have this. Now we have 2, 2, and 6. There's some tie breaking there. It would pick one of them. And then uh, next, it, it'd find one of those two goals and declare success. But so what happens with greedy is that you might end up finding this longer path to the goal that you would find um, if, you, um, if you were more careful about how you expand. How about A star search? A star search will consider both G and H. And keep in mind here, G is the cumulative cost so far. So the reason G is 2 here, it's 1 plus 1 together 2. So A star means you do it by G plus H. So how will it expand? Well, it'll start with S, no choice there, expand, then A, no choice there, expand. Now we have B, D, E. That's our fringe, which has the lowest G plus H. It would be this one here for 6 total, expand D, then it would be over here. It would not declare success yet, remember, we don't declare success just when we put something on the fringe, it's when we pop it off. Now we look at what's lowest, G plus H, this one has 8, this one has 6, this one has 10, this one is lowest, we declare success um, because we popped a, state that, uh, an, a path that ends up in the goal state. So that's A star search and it would expand less nodes than uniform cost search expands, yet still, in this case at least, find the optimal path. Okay, so question. When should A star terminate? Can we stop when we enqueue a goal? No, we can't. 
And I've, I've tried to emphasize this a few times because it's the most commonly occurring bug in Project 1. We have to wait till we dequeue. Now, if you want to show something like that, if you want to say, I want to show to you that you have to wait till dequeue, and it's not enough to declare success when you end queue, the way to prove that is by showing a counterexample, showing that if you do it wrong on this example, things go wrong, you get the wrong solution, that shows that your algorithm then is wrong, and you should change it. So here's a small example showcasing that we cannot stop when we enqueue a goal, because what happens in this example is we start with S on our fringe. Then next we have A and B on our fringe. Then what would be next? Well, G plus H, we have four here total. We have three here total, so we'd expand B first. We then Q G. If we declare success at this point, we'd found a path of length five, but there is actually a path of length four. We need to wait. We have now A and G on the queue. G has a score of G equals five, H equals zero. So five, A has two plus two, which is four. We need to expand A. And now we get, we have on the fringe at this point S, S to A to G, as well as S to A, uh, S to B to G. This one has four, this one has five, both plus zero, because the heuristic at the goal is zero. And then we pop this one and we can declare success. Okay, so only stop when we DQ. Is A star guaranteed to find the optimal solution? Let's do a raise of hands. Who thinks yes? Okay. Who thinks no? Okay, so it's a bit of a mix. Um, so it's kind of a mixed answer also, but in generality, it's not guaranteed to be optimal. Some extra conditions have to be met before that guarantee is satisfied. So we will have that guarantee with extra conditions. Now, why is it not generally true? Well, the way to show it is by, again, showing a counterexample. Come up with a graph where A star search finds a suboptimal solution, and then that's your proof right there that it's not guaranteed to be optimal. Here's an example of such graph. If you run A star, a star search on this uh, graph, what do we get? We start with S on the, with a 0 plus 7, comes off the fringe. We have S to A with a 1 plus 6. We have S to G with a 5 plus 0. What's next? This one is next. Sorry about those vertical lines, not sure. Why? Um, this one is next, and that would mean we declare success, and we found this path here, the bottom one. Why did that happen? So the answer is this heuristic here is a very poorly chosen heuristic. It says that it thinks it's still six away from the goal, but it's only three away. And so because it thinks six, well, it's on the fringe, and it has to wait its turn much longer than it really should, and it doesn't get its turn soon enough for us to find it before we declare success. So that's also the intuition about what goes wrong when A star is suboptimal on a specific problem. It's whenever the heuristic is too pessimistic and forces things that are actually promising to stay on the fringe for too long, and you find something else in the meantime, and you declare success. OK, so the actual cost was smaller than the estimated cost from the heuristic. That's not a good thing. We need to do it the other way around. OK, so this is called an admissible heuristic. If your heuristic satisfies the property that it's optimistic, meaning that it estimates how much more cost you're going to get before reaching the goal from this state as a lower number or equal to what it really is, that's an optimistic heuristic, which is admissible, then A star search will be optimal. If your heuristic start too pessimistic, and they are inadmissible, A star search optimality guarantees will break. Because good plans, good partial plans, will be trapped on the fringe and not expanded on because the heuristic is holding it back. OK, so formal definition. H star n is the 
optimal cost with which you can get from this node n to the goal. Typically, we don't have access to that, but mathematically, it exists. And a heuristic h is admissible if for every node, it estimates something that's lower than or equal to the exact cheapest way to get to the goal from that state. What are some examples? Manhattan distance. It's lower or equal to the actual cost. If there's no walls, it would be the actual cost. And when there are walls, it might be an optimistic estimate of the actual cost. Um, pancake flipping. What we had there, number of uh, the, the ID of the largest one that's still out of place is optimistic because at the very least, you need to still go as deep as that one to rearrange things, which means flip at least that many pancakes to get to the goal. So it's, again, an admissible heuristic. Um, coming up with admissible heuristics is actually a lot of what's involved in using A star in practice. Because once you've coded up A star, it's there. You can use it. But when you now want to solve a new problem, you need to think about what's a good heuristic for this new problem. OK, so let's now formally prove that if we have an admissible heuristic, again, which means that for every node, we estimate the cost to the goal as less than or equal to what it really would be, um, then A star tree search will be optimal. OK. Assume A is an optimal goal node. So we hope to find this one in the search tree. Assume B is a suboptimal goal node. So failure would be if we expand B and then we would declare success before we get to A. And let's assume H is admissible. Our claim is that A will exit the fringe before B. If we can prove that claim, we're done. Because if we're, this is, we have an optimal goal node, any optimal goal node A, any suboptimal goal node B, and if we can sh show that A will be guaranteed to exit the fringe before B, then that is true for any such optimal and suboptimal goal nodes, and that means we'll always first expand the optimal one before we might consider expansion of the suboptimal one. So this claim is what we need to prove to, as a result, get optimality. How do we prove A pops off first from the fringe? OK, let's see. Imagine B is on the fringe. If B is never on the fringe, we have no trouble anyway. But imagine B makes it on the fringe. OK? This might be our fringe. What do we know? We know that when B is on the fringe, that also some ancestor N of A is on the fringe. Maybe it's A itself, maybe an ancestor. OK? How do we know that? If no ancestor of A is on the fringe anymore, then it means we already expanded A. Like when all your ancestors are gone, you mean you've and, and you've, you're gone, you've been expanded. There's no other way around it. So we know this will this condition to be true. Some ancestor or A itself will be on the fringe too. Then our claim will be that N will be expanded before B. Okay, so. Let's see how we can show that. f of n is less or equal than um, f of a. Why is that? Well, let's expand this. f of n is the backward cost plus the heuristic forward cost. f of n is smaller than g of a because that's what it means to be an admissible heuristic. It's the heuristic uh, uh, to be admissible means that it underestimates how much it'll cost to get to the goal, the optimal goal that you can reach from there. So that's using the condition of admissibility. This is where we use it. If it was not admissible, we could not take this step. So we need the admissibility to take this step. G of A equals F of A, because A is a goal node. So h is 0. The only way to be admissible at a goal node is by a heuristic that's 0. Heuristics need to be positive. So this is now true. Then next thing we'll claim is that f of a is less than f of b. Why is that the case? Well, the cost to get to a is less than the cost to get to b, because that's 
what we said at the beginning, A is a optimal way of achieving the goal, B is a suboptimal way of achieving the goal. That's exactly what this is. B is suboptimal. That also means f of A is smaller than f of B because the heuristic H is zero at all goal states, so including A and B. Now, we have f of N smaller than or equal to f of A, f of A smaller than f of B, which means f of N smaller than f of B, which means N will be expanded before B. Since N expands before B, and this was for an arbitrary ancestor N of A, we can repeat this argument for the next ancestor on the fringe, next one, next one. This will keep happening. Ancestors of A will continue to be expanded before B until finally it's A itself on the fringe, which will also be expanded before B. And we found A before B. Hence, um, we found the optimal path to the goal, not the suboptimal one uh, at B. So A expands for B, A star, three surge, with admissible heuristics. Remember, we needed that condition somewhere in our proof. Um, is optimal. Okay, I'll leave this up for you to maybe think over during a small break, and we'll start again in two minutes. Wise, greedy for us is when you use the heuristic as the only thing to have your to determine your strategy of what to expand next. Uh, you could think of it maybe greedy in some way in the kind of how maybe people use the terminology greedy in everyday world, but not the terminology, the technical terminology we use here. Greedy means something very, very specific. It means you just look at the heuristic and expand based on whoever has the lowest heuristic value. And um, repeat. So it's like specific to them, like AI and machine learning. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hey. Hi. Uh, just had a question. On, I think one of the previous slides. So you said the so F is the total like value received for N. Like F is G plus H. F is G plus H. G is backward cost. So the cost of all the actions so far to get you to N. Right. Accumulated together, summed together. And then H is the heuristic function that you choose to use. Okay. It's the estimate of the cost to get to the goal. Right, right, right. So then when we say um, F of N is less than or equal to G of A, so the cost all the way to get to A, we're saying that... So this step here, from here to here, that's what you're asking about, right? Yeah. That is saying that this heuristic is admissible. Admissible. That's the definition of admissible. We're saying that F of N, which is how much we estimate it takes from N to get to the goal, mm -hmm. and we know A is the optimal goal, right? The optimal goal. So the, we're saying that it's the cost encountered so far plus our estimate, and we know that that estimate is less than what it's really going to be. And G of A is what it's really going to be. Okay, yeah, from start. For total, from start. Okay. So that's okay. why the sum of these two is less than G of A. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's, it's good to go through this a few times. Okay. Um, Okay, I've so gone through it at least a hundred times by now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, good question. So we've proved that if there are two goals, and we we're going to reach the optimal mm -hmm. one before it comes. But we, I don't think we have to prove that we we're going to take the optimal path to achieve A. Okay, so that's maybe a slight terminology thing. Yeah. So when we're looking at the search tree, A corresponds to a path. A is, the, is a node, which corresponds to a sequence of actions and a sequence of states you traverse that ends in the goal and it's the one oh, that has yeah, corresponds right. to the shortest okay. path to any goal. Oh, I see. So, so that's just why it works one, out. one goal in the original search graph whereas in the search tree that same it could graph be that the, can yeah, be yeah. different branch. It could be that it's at A and B oh, or okay. it could be multiple states of satisfied goal and A and B could, could correspond to different ones. Right. Either, either way could be true. But the okay. proof holds for when A is the one that is the cheapest goal you can get to from the start, start state and encodes the path to get there. 
and the tree cannot converge branch. Correct. Mm -hmm. Hey. Uh, I was wondering how necessary the CS70 prereq is for the course. Um, I, so I think you will find out by doing the math self-diagnostic, which covers some of the, essentially, that's a, a way of measuring, do you have the math background? The first homework? Homework zero. Okay, yeah. I did that one. So if that goes time. well, then you should be fine. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you. What do you mean by suboptimal reading? Suboptimal means that you get to the goal, but the path you follow has higher costs than another path to a goal that has lower costs. Uh, this is a little bit unrelated question, but uh, mm -hmm. what do you think of the uh, uh, significance of memory networks uh, in terms of meta memory? This, uh, like, mm -hmm. this Memory or Absolutely. So memory will play a big role in everything we do as humans and in AI. It's the second half of the class. Not this lecture, but the second half of the semester. I'll, we'll look at those things. But like, in terms of like neural networks and, and you know, gradient-based uh, mm -hmm. optimization. I might have to restart. And this is not yeah. too tied into this lecture. But happy to talk about it in office hours yeah, or yeah. in the second half of the okay. semester. Cool, cool. Thank you. Hi everyone, let's uh, restart. So, one quick clarification um, that ties into some of the questions that came up during the break. When we talk about A is a, a optimal goal node, what does that mean? Remember, this is a search tree. So what is A? A encodes a, sequ a sequence of actions as well as a sequence of states that you traverse that get you from S to, in this case, we've assumed to achieve the goal, to a goal state. And we said A is an optimal goal node, which means that it encodes of all paths to all possible goals in your state space, A encodes the shortest path to any goal. That's what A is, that's what it means to be an optimal node in the search tree. There could be many goal states, and there could be many paths to each of the goal states. The optimal one is the one that is shortest from the start to any of the goal states, like the goal states that's closest to, to the start state and the shortest path to that particular goal state. To be suboptimal means you are a path to a goal state that is not as short as the path encoded in A. Any questions about the first half? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that, so your question is once we're here, why are we not done yet? The reason we're not done yet with the proof, even though at this point, intuitively, it's clear that we're going to get there, and I agree with you on that, that once we know that, we expect it to be true. Um, the reason we're not done yet is because we need to show that the process of how we pop things from the fringe will also get A before B. And essentially, what this is showing here, this entire reasoning is showing, if you look at it carefully, it's showing that you go in order of F cost, right? And you keep expanding in order of F cost, and anything lower F cost will happen before things that are higher F cost. And as a consequence, I mean, th those are the kind of ideas that are at play here, and that's why when you look at this, you might say, oh, maybe we're already there, but it turns out that we actually need to carefully look at the process, because this is not actually enough. Well, there, there, is some, there is some subtleties to think about, and we'll get to some of those later in lecture. And it is important to step through the algorithm and see what happens. And so the reason at this point that we say this is not enough is that um, A might not be on the fringe when B is on the fringe. So we need to say, well, when A is not on the fringe, we know an ancestor of A has to be on the fringe. And then we need to say, well, are we guaranteed that that ancestor will be expanded before B such that we can get A on the fringe 
before B gets expanded. And so that is what we still need to do. Another question there? It does not assume it's accurate. It assumes it, it's admissible. And admissible is this very kind of specific mathematical condition that the heuristic value at each node is lower than or equal to the cheapest cost path to the nearest by goal from that node. And that's what it means to be admissible. You can be admissible without being accurate. And then you might not be very informative. You might not help the A star search much in terms of being computationally efficient, but you will still have it be optimal. Um, in fact, special case, what if we said h equals 0? If we said h equals 0, this condition is satisfied. We can still run A star search, but it actually becomes equivalent to uniform cost search. And so the proof we just showed here also proves that uniform cost search is optimal because it's a special case of this. Um, but it's not as efficient than a more accurate heuristic might be. Other questions? Over there. Um, how, how do we know our heuristic is admissible? Um, let me see if you still have that question as we're a little further down this lecture. Um, but, right, you don't want to have to rely on knowing h star n, because if you know h star n everywhere and you're going to explicitly check against that, you might as well use h star n. So that's not what we want to do. We'll get to that, what we actually want to do. Over there. Um, how do we know in the first part that f of n is less than or equal to g of a? That's the definition of admissibility. That's the key place where we need the assumption that the heuristic is admissible. H being admiss admissible means that from n, the cheapest way to get to a goal has to cost less than h of n. And so we know that this thing here, G of A, is the cost to get to the goal encoded in node A. And so we know that the cost encountered so far to get to N plus our heuristic, which underestimates the extra cost still yet to come, together should be smaller than the actual cost. That's what this is, and that's the admissibility. And if we don't assume admissibility, we cannot go through with this proof. And that's also, I mean, we expect that, that we need it somewhere because we've seen counterexamples. When heuristics are not admissible, we can have counterexamples where A star tree search doesn't find the optimal solution. Yes? So how to choose heuristics, we'll see more of that soon. Okay. So what are some properties? Uniform cost search versus A star search. Um, uniform cost goes equally fast in terms of its expansion in all directions, whereas A star will zone in towards the goal if you have a reasonably good heuristic. Um, pictorially, looks like this. And looks at, let's also take a look on the maze environments. So we'll do demo one and five. So remember, this is. Um, Uniform cost search. What do we expect for A star search? It'll again depend on the exact heuristic we're using. Here we're using a heuristic that is saying, I take the straight line distance to the goal, and I take half of that value as my heuristic. So things that are closer to the goal get favored, but maybe not favored as much as, as you might want. And here is the result in action. So it still expands a bit in all directions, but favors the direction towards the goal and doesn't need to expand as much as uniform cost search. Remember, uniform cost expands this many nodes compared to A star, this many nodes. How about the Pac-Man environment? Um, well, here is the result of A star search. We see that it expanded again. The, the coding is red means expanded at some point. The 
brighter red, the earlier we're expanding, the darker red, the later. Black means never expanded. We see, and we'll, let's do a comparison with other things we've seen. Um, greedy expanded very little, but the path found was suboptimal. Uniform cost expands everything below cheapest path cost to the goal, which was everything but one square. And then A star search is somewhat in the middle, uh, does a bit more work than greedy, but as a result also finds the optimal path. How to know what will get expanded by A star search if you look at this? Can you just like eyeball what will be expanded? Um, well, it depends on the heuristic. What if the heuristic is the Manhattan heuristic? Then you can say, well, what is the shortest path to the goal? What is the, what's the length of the shortest path to the goal? And then you can say, every state that I can reach with um, F cost, lower than that, will need to be expanded first. So anything that has cost plus heuristic lower than cheapest path to the goal will be expanded, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. You, this is used in many, many applications. A star is typically the go-to planning algorithm, whether it's for video games or routing or decoding in speech recognition, machine translation, and so forth. Um, let's take a look at this in action on the tiny maze first, six and seven. Okay. So let's run uniform cost search. Look at the console here to see how many nodes are being expanded, the work that's being done. OK, we're starting. It expands over 9,000 nodes before it finds a path. It's uniform cost. It will find the optimal path, clears the board optimally. Now. So remember, over 9,000 nodes expanded. Now let's take a look at A star search. How many nodes does it expand? It expanded, well, less, less than 1,000. Only 175 nodes expanded to find the optimal solution. So thanks to this heuristic, it could find the solution a lot more quickly. Um, now let's do a few demos of different algorithms in action. This is our water maze. Dark blue means more expensive to traverse. Uh, light blue is cheaper to traverse. Let's guess algorithms. So how about this one? Anyone? Bread first, because it zones out in every direction equally fast and finds the shortest number of steps path. How about um, this one? Greedy. It finds thing that's closest to the goal based on the heuristic and keeps expanding that and doesn't have to do much work, but doesn't find the best path either. How about um, this one? Uniform cost. How do we know? Well, it moves forward more quickly in regions where the cost is lower, but it does expand everywhere, and it actually does not orient itself much towards the goal. How about this one? Depth first search, yes. <laughs> How about this one? That's A star. It pays attention to cost incurred so far, also what's looking like it's getting closer to the goal and can do a relatively small amount of work, find the optimal path. OK, so part of the art is creating good heuristics. Um, we saw straight line distance as one, Manhattan distance as one for Pac-Man. Um, Inadmissible heuristics can be useful at times. You might lose optimality, but they might be informative. And just like greedy, you might get your solution faster, but not the right solution, not the optimal one. You might sometimes just want to find a solution fast. Um, let's do some uh, kind of practice here in designing heuristics. OK, this is the eight puzzle. What are the states in the eight puzzle? Well, it corresponds to all possible configurations of the board. How many states are there? Well, there's nine positions for the first tile, eight for the next one, seven for the next one, and so forth. Then there's nine factorial states. What are the actions? You can move a tile into the empty spot, or another way to think of it, you can move the empty spot around. 
How many successors from the start state? Well, there are four tiles you can move into that, so four successors. What should the cost be? Well, that's you as a designer choose, but maybe you don't want to put too much effort into sliding these things into place, and so every time you have to move a tile, that's a cost of one. Okay, so now let's think about heuristics. What would be a possible heuristic for this problem? So an estimate of how much how many more actions, how many more steps you need to get to the goal in this case? Any thoughts? Over there. So number of tiles in the wrong position. Why could that be a reasonable heuristic? Let's think about it. Um, might it be admissible? Um, yeah, it is admissible, because every tile in the wrong place will need to undergo an action and likely more actions will be needed, so it's an underestimate of the cost you'll incur to achieve the goal state. Um, so we've reasoned through the fact that it is admissible without having to compute what the actual optimal cost is to the goal state. So we just had an abstract reasoning that told us this is indeed admissible. Um, for example, what's the heuristic for the start state here? Well, looks like all eight are out of place, so eight. Um, if you run uniform cost search, um, and we have a problem where the goal is four steps away. It expands 112 nodes, eight steps away to get to the goal from star state, 6,300 nodes expanded, 12 steps away, 3.6 million nodes expanded with uniform cost search. A star with this heuristic, only 227. So a lot of time saved. Another way to think of this heuristic is that it's a relaxed problem heuristic. What do I mean with that? One way to ensure that your heuristic is admissible is to introduce new actions. You take your original problem, you add new actions, and in this new hypothetical problem space, you find the optimal solution. And because this is the optimal solution, in a new space we have more actions available to you, the optimal solution there will be cheaper or same as the optimal solution in the real scenario. So you know Optimal in this new relaxed space is an admissible heuristic. How's this? How can we relax this? Well, like this. Essentially, what we think of here is that if every action, if you have as an action available to just grab a tile and place it onto the destination, in that space, number of actions you need is equal to number of misplaced tiles, and it's an easier problem than the original one. It's a relaxed problem, so optimal solution in the relaxed problem is an admissible heuristic for real problem. Um, let's see, can we do better than this? Can we have an even better heuristic? Meaning something that's closer to the true cost. So one suggestion is the largest number that's misplaced. Any other suggestions over there? So some of Manhattan distances from s for each of the tiles from where they are at the beginning to where they need to end up. Okay, that is the heuristic we have on this slide here. And how does that correspond to a relaxed problem? It's as if you can slide the tiles without them constraining each other. So it's a relaxed problem, less constrained. For Pac-Man, relaxed would be something like ignore the walls. Um, here it's ignore the other tiles. It's a relaxed problem. We call it total Manhattan distance. It is admissible because it's a relaxed problem solution. Another way to think of it is through more abstract reasoning, it's admissible because every tile has to undergo at least that many steps before you can achieve the goal. H for start, well, we need to look at every one of these pieces and see how far they're away and sum it up. And this brings it from 227 expansions for the tiles heuristic from the previous slide to only 73. Remember, uniform cost surge was 3.6 million. Having a good heuristic allows a star search to be much more effective than uniform cost search. Of course, you can run A-star search with the heuristic that's always zero. It'll again have to expand 3.6 million nodes because it's just like uniform cost. OK. How about using the actual cost as a heuristic? Would it be admissible? Yes. Actual cost is less than or equal to actual cost. So that's, that's satisfied. Would we save on nodes expanded? Yes. A lot. Um, what's wrong with it? We don't know it. If you know it, you're done. You've already solved the problem. So there's a trade-off here between you know, the amount of computational costs required to compute your heuristic and 
the resulting number of nodes expanded, which also takes time. Okay, so the closer you get to the true cost, the fewer nodes you tend to expand, but usually the closer you want to get to the true cost, the more work you have to do to compute the heuristic. And so that's the trade-off. You can actually define a semi-lattice of heuristics. So earlier we were talking about, is one heuristic better than the other one and so forth? For example, for pancake flipping, well, you can define this as follows. You have two heuristics, and we say HA is dominating HC if for all nodes, HA is higher than HC. Now, not all heuristics can be compared this way. Sometimes a heuristic is higher in one node, lower in another node. Then they will live kind of next to each other, like here. But if you are strictly higher in all nodes, you can put yourself above another node. For example, A is above C, and they're all above zero. And you can build this partial ordering shown in this graph here that at the bottom has the all zeros heuristic, at the top has the exact, and the further you go to the top, the more informative your heuristic is, but possibly more expensive to compute. And one nice little trick is that if you have two heuristics, you take the max, that'll dominate them. And so if you have two heuristics that are both admissible, the max will be admissible and will be more informative than either one of them. Okay, in the last kind of 10 minutes that we have here, I want to switch up the algorithm that's powering all of this. So, so far we've done tree search and what's been different across approaches is the strategy of what to expand next from the fringe. Now we're going to change tree search into graph search. Why? Well, on the left is a state graph, and on the right is a search tree for this. If you look at this, well, B appears multiple times, C appears multiple times, there'll be exponential growth in terms of how often a node appears. And do we really need that? Do we really need to keep track of all paths to A, from A to B to C and so forth? Or might it be that just one of them is enough? Like, might it be that just this C is enough, and once we've, once we've looked here, we don't need to look here or here or here anymore? Because if we could do that, we could save a lot of time. And that's exactly what graph search proposes. Graph search will keep track of a um, list of nodes you've expanded and not expand them again. For example, in breadth first search, you have um, this is the search tree, and we should not expand these nodes. Why not? Why should we not expand this one over here? E is also over here. And if it's breadth first search, this way of getting to E is better than this way, because this one takes one step, this one takes two steps. So we already got there in one step. We should not later again see what's underneath E, because we got there in a worse way. So anything we find underneath here is worse than anything we find underneath here, because we got to E with more cost. And what's underneath is the same anyway. We're not going to find anything new here. We're just going to have gotten there in a worse way. There's no point in all doing all that work again. So the idea in graph search is you never expand a state twice. How do you implement this? It's just like tree search, but you have a set of expanded states, which we'll call the closed set. The closed set, whenever you expand, whenever you call a successor function on a state, you first do a quick sanity check. Have I already called a successor function on this state? The closed set will tell you. If you have, skip it. Just, you don't do it. If you haven't, you do call your successor function, but you then add the state to the closed set. It's important to store this as a set, um, not a list. Some literature even calls it closed list. When they call it closed list, same thing, but it's not great terminology because if you store it as a list, the time it takes to traverse the list and find whether you're in there or not is much worse than when it's stored as a set and your algorithm will be really slow. So that's why we call it explicitly closed set, and you should code it up as a set. Can it wreck completeness? completeness? Well, let's think about this. What does it mean to be complete? It means that if a solution exists, you'll find it. What do we not do? Which part of the search tree do we exclude here? It's parts of the search tree that we already have expansions for. So... If we exclude something by doing graph search, it's something we already have somewhere else anyway, so we're not losing access to the goal by what we're excluding in our expansions. So still complete. How about optimality? Well, that one's trickier. Um, 
So let's look at A-star graph search gone wrong, suggesting that it's not always optimal. So here are some heuristics. Here is some costs. Um, search tree. Expand, 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 expand. We build out our search tree. What do we do now? Well, we found the bad path, bad path to the goal, but luckily we don't expand yet. We're going to expand this one first. And now we've gotten here and here. But what will graph search say? My closed set already has C on it, so I'm not expanding this. And now only thing that's left is this thing here, and we declare success. So what happened here is that we first expanded along this path, and then later when we found the better path to C, we said we already expanded from C, let's skip it this time. So we need to be careful in graph search that the first time we expand, it's actually when we were there in an optimal way. Because if not, we might never do it the optimal way. In fact, we will never do it the optimal way. So the issue here is some kind of poor choice of heuristics in some sense guiding us down the wrong path at that time. So what we need is more than admissible heuristics. We need consistent heuristics. The main idea is that the estimated heuristic costs are not just more than actual cost to the goal, but everywhere things need to be representative. So admissibility was just about cost to the goal and heuristic. Um, and that's what we have here. Consistency will be about locally checking that things are consistent between the heuristic and the actual cost. So here in that graph we just looked at, we have h of 4 over here, h of 1 over here, and a cost of 1 here. That is inconsistent. If we think from a is going to be 4, but then after one step, after a cost of 1, we think it's 1, that doesn't make sense. If we really think it's 1 from c, we should think it's 2 from a. There's an inconsistency in our heuristic choices there. Okay? If we make it 2, it becomes consistent, and if we revisit the previous example, it'll find the optimal solution. Consequences of consistency. The f value along a path never decreases. Um, why is that? We have a heuristic value, and the heuristic value is smaller than... This is consistency. So consistency means this. Then we just add backward cost on both sides. Together, that makes for f. And what we see here is that f of a, the node we started from, and C, the node we ex got after the expansion, F of A is smaller than F of C. So it sees consistency implies as we expand, F will go up and up and up and up. And that goes back to some of the original intuition in one of the questions. It said, if we have consistency, which is a stronger condition than admissibility, F will keep going up as we expand. And that means that if we have consistency, whenever we expand the goal state, we know we're done, and we found the optimal path, because every, everything else will have a higher F cost on the fringe. Because otherwise, we'd have done it first. Whenever we expand the goal, everything else has a higher F. And thanks to consistency, we see that after we expand the node, F goes up. So in the future, every F will be even higher. And so consistency implies F costs keep going up as we run the search, which in terms implies that when we expand the goal, there's no option left for us to ever encounter something with lower F cost. There's a more formal proof on this in the uh, slides here. Um, but since we only have two minutes left, um, I'm just going to leave you with that main intuition that's really important. If you have a consistent heuristic, F cost will keep going up, which in turn means when you expand the goal, nothing else could ever be lower again in the future. These are the optimality properties for both tree search and graph search. Different conditions. One implies the other. That's just applying the consistency to the path to the goal. And here's a summary. A star uses both backward and forward cost. It's optimal for tree search with admissible heuristics, for graph search with consistent heuristics. Heuristic design is key. To make it good, in your project one, you'll do a lot of heuristic design to make your algorithm go fast. Often, you'll use relaxed problems to get there. The slides have pseudocode for you, which will be useful for your project, and a more formal proof of optimality of A star graph search, which you can do in your own time. Thank you.